Hi, I'm Tony and welcome to our video about Suzuki's GSX S1000 GT. Suzuki's tongue-twistingly titled GSX-S1000 GT is essentially their GSX-S1000. I've said it twice successfully with some extra touring capability added to it. It's not really a surprise that it's actually a pretty damn good bike because the naked bike underneath it, we rode it last year. And I've got to say, I found it a big, big step on from the bike that went before. Some of the older GSX-S's were a bit shaky, shall we say whereas the revamp for 2021 actually made it a really respectable naked bike. So now add GT on the end for Grand Touring and it's got more distance capability. Well, that's the idea anyway. So we've had this bike for about two weeks to make some of our kit review videos and it coincided with me being on holiday. So I was actually able to take this away for a few days and use it in the way it's intended on a big trip. Went in through Wales, out. From, from South Wales up through to now, North Wales, out through the top, done about 500 miles over three or four days, and found that it's right. It has got really good distance capability to it. That bike underneath is still a really flexible engine. The architecture goes back to Suzuki's real legendary and famous K5 GSX-R1000 from 2005. The K5, which was a great, flexible, crazy quick motor, it's not quite got that legendary performance here in 2022. 150 horsepower though still, and 106 Newton meters of torque. So it's still a really mighty engine. And when you're touring, it's really flexible, really easy to access that performance. You've got a choice of three riding modes. A is full fat, B is kind of touring. So it's a gentle throttle response early on, and then it picks up to reach full power. And then you've also got C, which is probably only really useful if it rains. And thankfully there wasn't too much rain on my trip, so I didn't bother with C. It's got the up and down quick shifter that you also find on the naked bike that it's based on. And for touring, that's surprisingly handy. You might think quick shifters, yeah, okay. And auto blippers, yeah, that's the sort of stuff that racers want. But when you're touring, just taking the need to worry about the clutch lever and throttle blipping and all that stuff out of the equation is actually quite surprisingly handy, useful, it's quite relaxing. I didn't take a pillion on it, but having that capability with a pillion, I think that's going to make gear shifts much, much smoother than having to clutch it and roll the throttle. I think you're just going to keep the bike a lot more level when you're riding two up. It's got cruise control. Didn't have to use it very much, but when I did, it was really helpful. Just gives you a little bit of respite for your wrist. You just sit there, coast along at that fixed speed. Also, really useful if you find yourself in any average speed camera zones, because you can just fix that speed at 50. No big threat that you're gonna just creep above the speed limit and find yourself with a nasty letter on the doorstep when you get back. In terms of the other stuff on the bike, it's really got good luggage provision. We had a guy at the shop the other day who's got the previous model of this, the GSX-S 1000F, and he was desperately looking around for luggage options because he was really finding it quite hard to even mount a really simple piece of luggage to the back of his bike. But I carried a Krieger US 40 tail pack on this bike. There's plenty of loops and fixing points to attach stuff to, so I had no dramas at all with that. So I can't argue with that. There are panniers available as an optional accessory if that's something that you really want to go down the line. But personally, I'm not a big fan of panniers. Motorbikes, I really like the fact that they're narrow. You stick panniers on them, they're not narrow anymore. And I am way too clumsy to ride a bike that's any wider than it needs to be. So let's move on to it as a bike. It's bloody good. 150 horsepower is plenty for me. And on a tour, it's plenty fast enough. And the 19 litre tank gives you plenty of option to ride before you need to fill up. I'd say if you don't go absolutely nuts, you can easily expect 190 miles and still have more. I think if you really, really wanted to try and test the range, you'd get above 200 miles. The readout on the clocks was saying in the 50s for miles per gallon when I wasn't going crazy with it probably a little bit unrealistic, but I would say around about 50 is probably about right. And while we're talking about those clocks, I know how important clocks are to people because we found that from the videos we've made about bikes before. These are really quite decent. It's interesting that they keep it really simple and it feels like a digital representation of the clocks, the analog clocks that Suzuki had on their bikes before. So you get the little dial that flickers around the rev needle that you get as it flickers around. But all the essential information's there. It lets you select between your drive modes and all that sort of stuff. And 
never a problem with those clocks. But underneath it all is a riding experience. I found this bike really, really good. It's nimble, it's quick enough, it handles well, it's comfortable. Only a couple of times did I really have to sort of drop a leg off the peg just to give it a shake around. There's plenty of leg room, there's plenty of space to move around on the bike, there's plenty of reach, the mirrors work really well, the screen's nice and protective. As a touring bike, it's really credible. Plenty of grunt to get you the overtakes that you want to get. And I rode this on like the hottest day that Britain's ever known was part of my tour. It was a sort of tour that you yourself and think, what the hell am I doing? 38, 39 degrees. So if I was ever going to be really uncomfortable on a bike, it was going to be then. But this was just never a bother at all. It seems like Suzuki have done exactly what they set out to do. And they've created a distance capable bike based on that GSX set, GSXS 1000. See, I told you it was a tongue twister of a title and it costs 12,000 pounds. So we've had a bit of a look around at what you can also get for that. And it seems to be on a par with what else there is around. You couldn't call it particularly cheap, but nor is it particularly expensive. It seems to be kind of on the money for a bike like this. I've had this bike for two weeks and do you know what? I've been really happy with it. It's got the sporty potential that you might want on the days where you're not off touring because it's not all about touring but it's got that ability to do good long trips without making you feel uncomfortable and with plenty of room to get your luggage on it. I've enjoyed my time with it and I wish I could keep it longer because it's a lot newer, a lot more comfortable, a lot better than my really elderly Yamaha Phaser FZ1, which really I should be replacing. So maybe this is a contender for that, we'll see. Thanks for watching.